Hey everyone, this is like my third time doing it, so I apologize to everyone who is seeing me for, for the third time today. Um, some of you have. So um, my name is Anya Herlich. I am a professor in physics, assistant professor in physics, and um, I am also a member of the Canadian Consortium, Consortium of the um, Science Equity Scholars. And we are conducting Canada-wide survey about students' sense of belonging in the widest uh, term of it um, in STEM. And what we would like to check or what we would like to find out from you is how do you feel about your belonging in both this particular class, but also in the field of physics in general. And we collect this information because we really, really care about building more equitable, more inclusive, more accessible STEM courses. And um, so this is what we would ask you to do. It says what you have to do, but you really don't have to do anything. This is university. But what we would like you to do is this. In the beginning of the semester, in the middle and at the end, and the beginning of the semester means starting tomorrow, we will uh, release three surveys. And they will ask you different questions. Some of them are demographics questions, but there's also questions about you know, those personal feelings about uh, fields and courses. And on the cover page, um, they're not very long. They should take like, I completed one just to try. It took me seven minutes. <laughs> So um, on the cover page of each survey, you will get consent, you will be given, you will be asked to give consent information for us to use your data. And you can absolutely say no and still complete the survey because every survey you complete gives you one third of a mark boost to your final grade. I think we cap at 100, so you cannot get more than 100. But if you complete all three surveys, we just add one mark, no questions asked at the end of the semester to your grade. Well, I won't be adding anything. Professor Harlow will be adding stuff. He promised. And um, th so that's it. And your professor won't know whether you, you know, what you said and won't know whether you opted for us to use your informa information or not. All that Professor Harlow will know is who completed the survey because he has to administer adding the bonus points, right? He will get your uh, responses, but only aggregated ones, only from those who agreed for us to use them, and only once all the grades are released, you know, everything is settled, all deferred exams are done and everything like that. And then, um, Survey one opens tomorrow. Announcements should show up on your website sometime today. Usually they like are released as I'm talking, so it should be there this afternoon. And uh, Professor Arti Ashok is our principal investigator and the leader of the University of Toronto team. And you can ask her any questions, clarification, concerns. If you, you know, agree for us to use your data but change your mind later, you can absolutely do that. Um, do not email physics teaching team about it because they're not supposed to know anything about it. So don't, you know, I know Professor Harlow won't be upset, but just don't do that because that would kind of compromise the information. And um, thank you for so patiently listening to me, especially if this is your third time. So <laughs> have a great thank class. Thanks very much. And see you in the workshop. Yeah. You'll see Professor Harlow in January if you take Physics 132 as well. So, okay. Everybody's doing all right. You want to do this one? <laughs> I was going to do this question um, on top hat at the end of last class, but let's do it now. You've got two people standing on a bridge, and they each have a rock. Um, Heather throws the rock straight down with an initial speed of 20 meters per second and hits the water. Um, Jerry, at the exact same instant of time, throws a similar rock straight up with 20 meters per second and it goes up, and then it goes down and also hits the water. The question is, which rock has the faster speed just before it hits the water? So maybe it's the old think, pair, share. So think about it, um, and then pair up, and share your answer with whoever you're sitting with, and hopefully you have the same answer, and that, that'd be great. If you kind of differ, maybe try to sort it out and vote the same way. Okay, maybe 30 seconds. Click in an answer, please, so that you get your point. Remember, you get 0.8 points just for participation, and the extra little 20% is for agreeing with me on this. Because <laughs> I have a definite opinion. Okay. So survey says, let's take a look here. 
Submissions closed. Let's see what people are responding as. Ooh, it's very, very mixed. Um, it's not quite third, 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 but uh, maybe 20% are voting for Hather, 30% um, voting for um, Jerry, and 50% voting for both hit the, uh, have the same speed. So Harlow thinks that it's um, C. That's the one I like, and I'll tell you why. Um, it's, there's a few different ways of looking at this. Sometimes I think of this as sort of a, a conservation of energy or something uh, idea, but let's say that this is the bridge, and let's put Heather over here and Jerry over here. They both have a rock, and they both throw it, and this one has, I guess, V initial is 20 um, meters per second downwards, but the speed is 20. And this one has V initial is 20. And so what happens, something happens. We don't, we're not given the height of the bridge, but there is some height. They're both the same distance. This one just is going to go down, and it's going to end up with some, like, V final, uh, which would be more than 20 because... It's uh, because of gravity, right, speeding it up. Um, so V, final. Then what happens with this one is that it goes up, stops, comes back down. And my assertion is that if you just look at the, when it comes back to the same height, it'll be going down with 20 meters per second. I don't know if you believe me on that one, but if you neglect air resistance, the idea is sort of like what goes up what must come down. If you throw something, Whoop. with 20 meters per second up, then when it comes back down and gets to the same height as where I threw it, it will have that same speed, but just in the opposite direction. Because it slows down at 9.8, stops, and then it, from rest, accelerates down also at 9.8 for the same amount of time, it's sort of symmetric, right? So whatever speed I threw it up with, that it eventually stops, if it starts from rest and comes down that same amount of time, it's going to have that, it's going to pick up the same speed again. Make sense? So 20, <laughs> as it passes my hand, it's also going 20 down. So this is why, by the way, <laughs> if you're celebrating, you should never take your gun and go, yay, <laughs> and shoot the gun up into the air, <laughs> okay? Because sometime later, those same bullets are going to come right down and go into your head at the same speed that they were if you, were, if you just fired it straight down. So don't do that. <laughs> Um, okay, and then so the idea here is that after this point, it's the same, um, uh, same as if it was thrown straight down. So it'll take longer for Jerry's rock to um, hit the water. It'll hit later, but when it hits the water, it will have the same speed as Heather's rock did when it first hit the water. Make sense? Down. I guess maybe from this point on. Does that make sense to you guys? Anybody want to object or <laughs> questions? Or... Yep. So the way up there. I'm going to chuck you the thing though. Ready? <laughs> Good catch. So if it stops at its apex yep. and its velocity is zero, yep. then when it comes down, isn't the only force acting on it gravity? Where does it get the 20 meters per second velocity from? From gravity. From, from gravity, okay. It's going to speed up. Anything that starts from rest from that high height is going to have some speed when it passes you, right? So whatever, gravity is the thing that's slowing it down on the way up. And then the exact same acceleration due to gravity is the same that's speeding it up on the way down, right? Oh, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Oops, sorry. <laughs> so far, we haven't actually knocked over any laptops with this microphone yet, but the semester's young, so. Oh, yeah, and there's this, of course. We're going to talk about... Uh... <laughs> We've got another... Jonathan found another rocket. It's a little more robust than the first one, so we can always fire that. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> but did you see the nice trajectory? Okay, so it goes up, follows some sort of curved path, 
And this is more of, I don't know, chapter four stuff, but uh, we'll do it one more time. We'll fire one more time, sort of in front of the screen this time, so that your video guys catch it. <laughs> Must be fun being a videographer for this class, right? <laughs> I'm the hell all over the place. Okay, one, two, three, go! Well, we almost lost it there. <laughs> it almost got caught up. All right, good. Well, what are we doing next? Okay, let's go over a graphical method for finding displacement. I was going to, again, talk about last time, sort of a chapter two thing. Um, and by the way, chapter two is all we're sort of covering for Tuesday's test. Chapter one, chapter two. Um, they're mostly chapter two problems, obviously, because chapter one was sort of more of an intro chapter with, without a lot of real questions in it. Um, the slope of a position versus time graph gives you the velocity. It's really the instantaneous velocity at any point. If it's a curved line on position versus time, then you take a tangent at any point to that curve, and that gives you the instantaneous velocity. And in calculus, we call that a derivative, but this is an algebra-based course, so you don't have to worry about the calculus part of it. Um, similarly, the, the opposite of a derivative is an integral. The area under a velocity versus time curve gives you uh, the displacement for the time interval that you're finding the area for. So let's do an example of, of doing that. Again, you might have seen on the pre-class notes, I was sort of planning to do this on Monday, but let's do it right now. So here is the velocity graph of an object that is at the origin, x equals zero meters, at t equals zero seconds. At t equals four seconds, what is the object's position? <laughs> uh, sort of phrased a little weird there, but this is the graph. So what I'm going to say, let's just write down the assumptions here. At t equals zero, uh, x zero equals zero, and v x uh, versus t graph is given. So we can just use this graphical method. So the idea here is that the area under, and by under, I mean from the graph down to the t-axis, um, the vx versus t graph gives um, the, the uh, displacement, we'll call it, delta x. Delta x, which is the x final minus the x initial. And so delta x equals the area of the shape. So the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to say, let's make it a square and a triangle, because I know how to find the area of a square, and I know how to find the area of a triangle. I'll just add them. So let's call this A1 and A2. A1 plus A2. So uh, area, uh, A1 is a square. So the area of a square is uh, length times width. So this is going to be, um, let's we'll call it LW. And then uh, the area of a triangle is one half base times height. So it's one half B times H. So we'll just write them over here, one half B H. So now I just have to put in all the numbers. And I think I might as well keep track of my units. Somebody has, has have asked me, a few times now, should I keep track of my units and all the intermediate calculations? And <clears throat> probably as you're starting off, that might be a good thing to do. It clutters up the equations a little bit, but it's, it's nice to get a check that your units are working out. So let's do that. Length, so let's call that, uh, let's say that this is L and then this is W. I don't know how you're going to, you know what I mean? And then we'll call this the base. I guess W and H are the same thing, <laughs> H but just used for different things. So L here is uh, two minus zero, two, uh, and what are the units? It's actually two seconds. Uh, and then times the W is four minus zero, and those are meters per second. So it is a bit weird that the, that the square has, <laughs> has these weird units, but that's okay. One half is dimensionless. The base here is four minus two, so that's, uh, again, two uh, seconds, and the height is, again, four meters per second. So we have to uh, cancel these seconds, which is good because we're trying to find a distance, right? So the seconds cancel. 
So that's good. So we've got 2 times 4 equals 8, um, plus 2 times 4 is 8, um, divided by 2 is 4. So the answer is 12. Delta x is 12 meters. And, and by the way, x0 is equal to 0. So I guess the x final is 12 meters as well. Maybe that's a better way of putting this circle. Can I erase just this box? Yeah. OK. And maybe that's the last chapter two slide, I guess. This morning's quiz was just really introductory questions about chapter three material, which people seem to respond to like 99% correct. So excellent work on the pre-class quiz. I'll, I'll mention a couple of them. These were a bit tricky. So an object is hanging by a string from the ceiling of an elevator. The elevator is moving upward with a constant speed. What is the magnitude of the force that the string exerts in the object compared with the force that the earth exerts in the object? So the, the thing that I read along here, if I'm reading, is I hear constant speed. And to me, that's kind of like ding, 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 ding. What this means is zero acceleration. It's not turning, and it's not speeding up or slowing down. So what this means is zero uh, net force. There can't be any unbalanced forces on this. So whatever the tension in the string is, it has to exactly cancel the force of gravity. And a student actually asked quite sensibly, well, let's think about this. If there's a force of the cable supporting the elevator and it's going up, why would it go up unless the force on the cable was greater than the force of gravity? Isn't the elevator being pulled up so the tension force should be greater than gravity? Good question. Surprisingly, no. Um, the reason that the elevator moves up is because it already was moving up. It's what we call an initial condition in physics. The initial conditions are the position and the velocity. So it's going up. And there's a tension in the cable. What that does is if the tension in the cable is uh, less than gravity, then there's an unbalanced downward force and the acceleration will be downwards. So if it's moving up, it'll slow down. If the tension were greater than the force of gravity on the elevator, then that would create an uh, unbalanced upward force. It would accelerate upward, so it would speed up. The only possible way you can get the elevator moving at a constant speed is when you balance those two forces. Same as if it's actually sitting perfectly still, actually. It's the same tension. God, complete silence. It's either you guys don't believe me at all, <laughs> or you believe me, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if you believe me. We'll, we'll, go, we'll, we'll circle around this a little bit more. Um, and then sim similar thing. If it's slowing down while moving upward, that means that the uh, magnitude of the force that the string exerts on the object is less than the magnitude that the Earth exerts on the object. So again, if this is the elevator, you've got downward force of gravity, and you've got the upward force of tension. And if it's slowing down, the acceleration is downwards, because these are both vectors, then I think the magnitude of, uh, wait a second, slowing down while moving upwards. So the magnitude of Fg has got to be greater than the magnitude of tension with my little alligator eating the bigger thing. OK. How did you learn physics when you were at U of T? Good question. Um, so basically, it was mostly doing homework, like problem sets with my friends, um, sometimes late into the night. But, and also, I would say, reading the book. But for me, I usually did it in that order, which may sound kind of bad. But what I, would, I think I started off by reading the book first. and. And then what I would do is then I'd say, okay, it would sort of go in one ear and out the other, and then I'd, then I'd start the problem sets, and I'd be like, oh, geez, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And then I'd go and read the book again. And after enough months of doing that, I just skipped the first part. <laughs> I would just, okay, oh, maybe I'm smart enough to just do this problem set all by myself, and I'd start trying it. And then I'd go, what the heck? And then, and then I, when I read the book, I kind of feel motivated. Like, I, it's, like a, it's like a scavenger hunt. I'm trying to find what I need to know. What am I missing that I can't do this problem set? And 
usually, I guess, maybe six times out of 10 or something, reading the book really helped me, and I was able to, to do these things. <laughs> the other four times out of 10, even reading the book, I still couldn't do the problem set, and that's when I started asking my, my friends and seeing around. And I had, usually after a month of a course, I usually had a handful or so of good friends, friends that were good enough that I could say, hey, did you, did you work on problem four yet? Did you get anywhere with it? And there'd usually be somebody who had uh, who'd cracked it <laughs> and was able to help me out. So that was, that was really helpful. Oh yeah, so I, I also found it a little hard to learn during lectures like this. I don't know why, but I think some people are like visual learners, and I think I'm one of those, and some people learn better by listening. I don't, like I'm terrible on telephones, and I also tended to sit right where you guys were sitting. This is sort of front row. And by the way, Professor Harlick, you just met, Matt, this is one of the big differences between us. We realize we can never sit together in classes or something because she wants to go right to the very, very back. She's a back row kind of person. So, anyway. Joke. Why did the force feel so weird when falling down? Because it didn't feel normal. <laughs> okay, that's... This is my, I get a, usually get a couple of jokes in this. This is one of my favorite. So if there's normal, it doesn't fall. If you take away the normal, it falls. You get it? So. <laughs> you guys get it. Nice joke. Well done. I salute you. Yeah, this was the, so uh, kinematics is the study of how things move. Dynamics, chapter three stuff, is the study of why things move. So let's consider this thought experiment. Oh dear. Um, James Bond, for some reason, is standing still in the middle of an ice-covered lake. If the surface and the bottoms of his shoes were both perfectly slippery, you know, sticky isn't at all, would he be able to move? That's the question. And the answer is, if you don't have any kind of friction under you, I guess you could move around and flop around, but you couldn't, like, accelerate, go somewhere. So, um, no. Basically, uh, an external force, or horizontal force in this case, is needed to accelerate an object. Okay. Um, and this, so basically, if someone threw him a rope and tied a rope around him, it could move. And a system is, an, is the object or group of objects that we choose to analyze. So usually, they, in the book, they draw a little dashed line around the system. So let's call the system this man. And then everything outside the system is called the environment and consists of objects that might uh, interact. So these are external interactions. So maybe there's a guy over here pulling a rope. This would be like the environment that matters. <laughs> because he's got a rope and he's pulling, and so this is going to exert an, an outside force on the person. And that's what could accelerate him along. So that's sort of what the book is talking about with systems. Turns out to be kind of important. Um, I'll just also go through a little quickly what, what a force is. So I've drawn a little arrow there. A force is a physical quantity that characterizes how hard and in what direction an external object pushes or pulls on the system. So it's a vector. Um, and from the system's perspective, there's a force exerted on the system. Um, and there's two, I guess, two kinds of forces, lots of ways of classifying forces, but one is if it's a contact force, like pushing on something, or if it's a long-range force, such as gravity. Gravity can kind of reach out into space and grab something and pull it. I guess mag magnets also uh, can give a long-range force. And there is a unit of force called the Newton. That's the SI unit that we use in this course, named after Isaac Newton, who thought a lot about forces long ago. So when we draw a force diagram, we represent the object or the system as a particle. The tail goes on the particle, and then we draw the force emanating away from the particle, and then we usually label it. So uh, let's just do an example quickly here. If we go back to this James Bond guy, um, I would draw, let's draw a force diagram for him. So I would draw a dot, and then I would draw all the forces I can think of that are acting on 
um, James Bond. And if this is like the lake, lake, um, then, and this is the rope, R is the rope, then what I've got is the force of the rope on, let's call it James Bond, B is Bond, James, James Bond, <laughs> okay. Uh, and then the, don't forget to put a little arrow in that because uh, it's a vector. And the little subscript first tells you what is the external thing and then on whatever the, it's acting on the system. So then there's the lake, pressures upwards. So there's a force of the lake on bond. And then there's another force, does anyone know? Gravity. So gravity, I'm just going to say that there's, the earth is down here. <laughs> So E is the earth. So I'm just going to put the force of E on bond. It doesn't depend on the lake necessarily. There's some force from the center of the earth that's reaching out and grabbing. And so that's the force diagram. OK. And then the net force, um, I'm just going to skip that one quickly. Net force, the sum of the force vectors um, is not a new force, it's the combined force of all, so the vector sum. So this sigma, capital sigma, um, means the sum of, sum of forces. So for example, if you're pulling upwards on this box and the box is the system, the force of you on the system is up, the force of the Earth on the system is down, and if, you, if your force is 150 newtons and the force of gravity is 100 newtons, then the net force, we say, is 50. Because you have to subtract the downwards and add the upwards. And so since there's a net force, the, the system, which is the box, will now accelerate upward. Speed up as it's going up, I guess. So we've got, uh, we got a bowling ball here, and I'm going to show you a couple of little experiments using this, uh, whoop, <laughs> this stick. So the stick, the idea is that if I push on it, you can even see it bend a little bit because it's exerting a force and it's sort of a springy kind of force to it. So experiment one, let's see if you've got a bowling ball, maybe, actually, does anyone want to catch the bowling ball and send it back to me? Maybe we'll use Parham. <laughs> you want to go down there and, uh, We'll use par. He's, he, I'm just going to roll it to you. Experiment one is the bowling ball rolls on a smooth surface without slowing down. There it goes. It doesn't require any force to get all the way to par. Okay, and then bowl it back to me. Nice. Next one, I'm going to, so actually, you know what, next one, you stand here for me and bowl it towards me, and I'm going to try slowing it down. Ready? Go. Okay, and I slow it down and stop it, <laughs> okay? So in order to stop the bowling ball, I have to exert a force in the opposite direction of motion. And that's that. And then, I guess, again, you want to bullet to me one more time, and I'm going to try to speed it up. <laughs> now I can push it in the same direction, and as I'm pushing it, whoop, it gets faster and faster and faster and faster until it <laughs> crashes into something, okay? Whoop. <laughs> Thank you very much. Maybe a round of applause for... Volunt student volunteer, thank you very much. Very cool. So the whole idea being that these outside forces are accelerating the object. And maybe we'll come back to that slide in a second. Experiment one, the net force on the ball, since I wasn't pushing it or pull, uh, with a ruler, was zero. So it moves at constant velocity in a straight line. Experiments two and three, that ruler was providing a net force, so it was accelerating. Either accelerating in the opposite direction of velocity, so slowing down, or accelerating in the same direction as velocity, so speeding up. But the point is the forces produce acceleration. We'll go back to that slide in a sec. What I want to do next is do a top hat question. So this one, you're supposed to choose all the answers that might apply here. So I'm hoping Top Hat allows you to select more than one answer. Is it working? <laughs> okay, I'm getting some nods. Don't just select one and click. 
Select as many as you think apply. Basic situation, I'm taking a tennis ball, I'm gonna to toss the ball straight up into the air. Immediately after I let go of it, what forces are acting on the ball? <laughs> so it's on the way up. And don't neglect air resistance, okay? So, like there. <laughs> on the way up, just after it leaves my hand, but it's no longer in contact with my hand, what are the forces acting on it? Remember, try to click all the forces you think matter before you submit. Want a little bit more time? About 30 seconds. So my hand is no longer in contact with the ball at this moment. The key question is, does the hand count? So <laughs> I'm not going to answer that. Let's, let's see what people say. This was a tricky one. Let's see actually how this displays. So it just shows what people voted for. So, so clearly, I agree with A. There's a downward force of gravity on the Earth on anything. It never goes away if you're near Earth. The only way to make gravity go away is to leave the Earth and go far out into deep space. So that's going to be, so A, I like. And then B was the question. So C, a small downward drag force from air resistance, I also like. And D, an upward inertial force carrying the, forward, the ball forward along its trajectory. So my feeling is that after it leaves my hand, no, there's no more force from my hand. So again, the question is, well, then why does it go up? How does it remember to go up if my hand's not touching it? Because it certainly does, right? You can't tell me I have some influence on that ball after it's left my hand. It's way over my head. Yep, Rachel. It's not the force that's, so it's not the force that's going up. What's going up? Yep. It's, it, it's the velocity. It's sort of these initial conditions again. If something has a velocity going up, it wants to keep going up. It has its own reasons or whatever. It's, it's, it's Newton's first law, actually. If something's moving, it wants to keep moving. Like the bowling ball, if you think of it. It was already moving long after Parham bowled it. And it's not you doing it, it's it. It keeps its velocity. And it doesn't require any upward forces at all. So that's another interesting thing. Both of these forces are downwards on its upward trajectory. There's no force pushing it up after it leaves my hand. Only its own inertia is what carries it up. Okay, good. Okay. So Newton's first law of motion is that for an observer in an inertial reference frame, um, when the net force on any object is zero, the object stays at rest or continues moving at a constant velocity. So that's the whole idea that we're getting at here, is that um, constant velocity in a straight line, I guess. Something continues moving unless there's an outside force on it. Let's do another little question here. Again, choose all the forces that apply here. Um, which of these have a net force acting on them? Let me start the question. Should show up now. Maybe we'll do it on the other laptop. A, a car moving on a curved road at a steady 50 kilometers per hour. B, a car moving on a straight, ro straight road at a steady 100 kilometers per hour. Uh, C, a golf ball at the peak of its flight through the air. Or D, a rock falling off of a cliff. So which of these do have like a non-zero net force acting on them? Let me give you 60 seconds to click on that. Again, think, pair, share. I don't think so. So you're allowed to assume a little friction, I guess. <laughs> 15 seconds, and I'll show you what my answer is. Are we good? Should we add another quick? Just in case you're still clicking in. 
Please submit and answer. Because I'm running out of time. 10 seconds. Do your best. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Time's up. Survey says. Um, so yeah, so I, so certainly most of these, if you're curved road, you're turning. That requires a net external force. Golf ball has got gravity pulling on it, maybe air resistance, it's got a net force for sure. Rock falling off a cliff, it has a net force. But what I would say about B is that if you're moving at a constant velocity, ding, 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 right there, you know the net force has to be zero. It's almost like the elevator. Sure, there's friction. Um, and there's air resistance on the car, but they must all be balancing out or else the car would accelerate. Okay, so the, it was a bit tricky there, but, uh, but B is the one that has zero net force. Awesome. I don't know what are we doing here. All right. So we did Newton's first law. Now we're going to do Newton's second law, which has mass. So what's mass? Mass is a scalar quantity that describes an object's inertia. And it's listed on those masses that they have at Hart House or the Athletic Center. It describes the amount of matter in an object, and it's an intrinsic property of the object. The SI unit is kilogram, and it tells us something about the object, regardless of where the object is or what it's doing or whatever forces may be acting on it. If you take me and put me on the moon, I'd have the same mass. And that's the letter M. And Newton's second law has an M in it. It's the acceleration is the net force divided by the mass. And this is the fan cart that you're going to be using next week in practicals, actually, is you're going to have these carts and you're going to attach fans to them and have them blown around all over the place. And so um, what the fan does is it produces a net force on... Um, on the object. And I guess the, usually if there's not much friction, uh, then, oh, sorry. Usually what happens is if it's not moving up or down, then the normal force balances out the gravity force. So there's just a horizontal net force. And you find the acceleration in the horizontal direction. So here's another top hat question for you. A little easier, I hope. There's only one answer to this one. <laughs> Please just choose one answer. Three forces act on an object that is shown. In which direction does the object accelerate if these were the only forces? So would it be up? A is up. B is uh, diagonally up and to the left. Uh, C is straight to the left. D is diagonally down to the left. And E is straight down. It's really, yeah, so assume that the magnitude is proportional to the length of the arrows there. So if I draw a longer red arrow, it means a, a stronger force. OK. 10 seconds. Feels good. Let's see what survey says here. Stop answering. Um, repeat bonus. Yeah, so good. That's what I like. So if you add up these forces, and I can show it on the other screen here, um, there's, there's various ways of doing it. But if I was to add, say, F1 plus F2 by using the parallelogram rule, these are perpendicular so that the diagonal goes right along here. So this vector is F1 plus F2. This is how you add three vectors, by the way. Just add two of them, and then add that sum to the third vector. So now you can use parallelogram rule to add F1 plus F2 plus F3. And then you get this one across like that. So that is uh, F net is equal to F1 plus F2 plus F3, the sum of all the forces. And then the acceleration is in the same direction as the net force. OK, so I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about the list of forces you might encounter. And again, I'm going to skip that one. <laughs> I'm going to come back to that next class because it's, it's a really uh, cool question about the airplane. We'll do that next class. Uh, in physics 131 and 132, 
you're going to encounter gravity force, normal force, tension, kinetic friction, static friction, which are kind of different, by the way, uh, the spring force, so if you compress or stretch a spring, that can exert an external force on something, the electric force, which really that's more uh, Professor Harlick will talk about that. So this is more of um, a physics 132 concept. Um, there's magnetic, same thing. Um, thrust, they talk about that sometimes in the book, like from a rocket. Uh, the drag force, that's like air resistance. And I guess the muscle force, if you're looking at a biological problem, muscles can exert forces on tendons or, or, uh, or ligaments, which then exert a force on a bone. So if I stand on a table, this was this idea before, if you, why did the force feel weird it was missing or when it was falling? So if I stand on the table, there's an upward normal force on me. And it is balancing a downward gravity force. Because if I step off the table and remove the normal force, then I accelerate downwards until something else exerts a normal force on me to stop me. It's weird. You'd think there's nothing happening when you're standing perfectly still. But there's two things happening. One is that you're being pulled towards the center of the Earth. But luckily, somebody else is saving you by pushing you upwards and preventing you from accelerating in that way. Yes, question. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a great question. You're asking, do, do I want you to write the subscripts all the time like this? It doesn't matter, but uh, I like writing the subscripts where you put the object and then the, the external person and then the, the object you're acting on. This is me water skiing, and uh, a few years back in Idaho, my, near my mom's place, um, the rope exerts a tension force on Harlow. And it's pulling me along. If there is an angry bird flying through the air, you would say, just check the time here. Yeah, it's 11.57. Still got three minutes, I think. <laughs> Maybe just grab a seat. Give me another three minutes. Um, the way you calculate, so this is one of the forces, normal and um, uh, tension force, they don't have any equation for them. But gravity is one of the few, uh, few forces that has its own equation, which is that the force is equal to, um, let's write it down, g times its mass. So it's equal to the mass of the object, which is the angry bird in this case, times g in newtons per kilogram. So that lowercase g has something to do with the mass of the Earth and the radius of the Earth, and we'll talk about that later. But um, it's the equation that always works for that one. Okay, so here it is actually. If an object of mass mo is near the surface, so we'll put it right, right here, o, <laughs> that's the object, and this is e, near the surface of a large planet we might call Earth with a radius of 630... 6,376 kilometers and a mass of 5.7 times 10 to the 24 kilograms, then there will be a gravitational force acting on the object called its weight. And when you have all these particular values, you get 9.8 newtons per kilogram for the surface of the Earth. If we went to the moon or something, you'd have a different mass planet, you'd have a different radius, and so you'd have a different acceleration due to gravity. And so the, the force of gravity would be different. But most of the problems in this course take place on Earth, so that's why we have this force. And here's a, here's a little joke. A farmer has a donkey, and every morning the donkey pulls a wagon from the shed to the field. But then the donkey enrolls in Physics 131 and learns Newton's third law, which is that if the donkey exerts a forward force on the wagon, then the wagon will exert an equal and opposite force backwards on the donkey. So the donkey refuses to pull the wagon with the reasoning, what's the point? If I pull forward on the wagon, the wagon will pull backwards with an equal and opposite force on me. So I'll never be able to accelerate that wagon. So, so think about that. <laughs> I'll give you the answer on Friday. Um, what is the flaw in the donkey's reasoning? Okay, great. Thanks for your patience. I'll see you Friday. <laughs>